Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. It's so nice to see you all here today, and I've looked forward to being with you for some time. We are living in the last days, and the things that we read in Scripture have special application to God's people in the last days. The Scripture says, These things happened unto them for in samples upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so we can learn the lessons of the uh, stories of the Scripture and understand and apply them to our own lives. And today I'm going to share with you a series of sermons on the topic called Joseph's Troublesome Coat. Joseph had a coat, you know. He was given a coat by his father. And that coat got Joseph in trouble with his brothers. And we'll just explore that a little bit today. But also there were other coats in Joseph's experience that got him and others in trouble. And we will see how that plays out as well. And along the way, we will look at the great principles of the scripture concerning how these things apply to us. So turn with me in your Bibles today to Genesis chapter 37. We'll begin with Genesis 37 because this is the beginning of the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is one of the most blessed stories of, of alienation and reconciliation. Perhaps there's no greater thing for us than to be reconciled to God after we have been alienated from God. And God, of course, has a plan for us in this reconciliation because it's a powerful emotional experience for us. Genesis chapter 37, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. Now I want you to notice the age of Joseph. He was 17 years old at this time. And he was feeding um, the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, what was Joseph doing to his brothers? He was telling his father all the bad things that his brothers were doing. Now, nobody likes a tattletale. <laughs> nobody likes someone who will tell all their evil deeds and bad things. And so his brothers became very unhappy with Joseph because everything they did that was wrong, he would tell his father. I think Joseph may have also felt a little bit of superiority, spiritual superiority over his brothers. After all, when you are constantly noticing the bad things and telling your father about them, you would feel like you are somehow the, the judge or the, the righteous conscience of the family, so to speak. And, and so Joseph perhaps had a little bit of maybe spiritual pride and arrogance in his, in his heart. Um, nevertheless, it says in verse 3, <coughs> Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old, his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, this was not an ordinary coat. This coat was a coat of authority and um, position and of respect. This coat was a coat that was designed especially to set Joseph apart from his brothers. It was a coat that was designed to give, give him some level of um, elevation above his brothers. This was not just an ordinary coat. Now his brothers saw this, in verse 4 it says, and when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him 
and could not speak peaceably to him. These brothers were angry at Joseph. They were very unhappy with the way Joseph had treated them, and they were also jealous that he was uh, somehow favored by his father. This favoritism perhaps created something for Joseph, or that created a problem for Joseph, because favoritism in the family often alienates the children one from another. <laughs> they think that mother or father likes one or the other better than the others, and this causes some tension in the family. If you have had any children of your own, you probably know what I'm referring to. <laughs> and, uh, you know, parents have to be careful about how they do this. But all of this was in God's, uh, God's way. You know, this coat gave Joseph stature. It gave him um, authority. And it also gave him a sense of his father's intention to make him the recipient of the birthright. Now, Joseph was not Jacob's eldest son. Who was the eldest son of Jacob? Does anyone know who the eldest son was of Jacob? Well, that was Reuben. Reuben was the eldest son, and Reuben was the one who the brothers looked to for guidance and leadership and, and you know, authority. They did not look to Joseph. They hated Joseph, so they weren't going to look to him for authority. <coughs> so they could not speak peaceably to Joseph. There was alienation already, but it was going to get a whole lot worse. Verse 5. Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet even more. So, this did not help the relationship for Joseph to have a dream. Who gave Joseph his dream? It was God. God gave Joseph the dream, and God knew that his brothers were going to hate him all the more. So why did God give him the dream? It's because God was setting up a set of circumstances that would one day bring them closer together than ever they could have come back together had they not had alienation in the first place. You know, that's the way God is. When you have alienation and you have reconciliation, you are closer together as friends than when you were before you ever had the alienation. Uh, verse 6, And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my sheaf. You can imagine them all standing around there, bowing down to the one sheaf, eleven of them, you know, plus the father and mother. So his brothers reacted, and they said unto him, verse 8, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? They already saw the meaning by, of this dream, right at the very beginning. Do you think you're going to rule over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Little did they realize that one day Joseph was going to be their ruler. <laughs> You know, when you think about the story, uh, this was God telling them in advance what was going to happen. God does not do anything with his church without telling them what to expect. 
And it's interesting that God did this with the church of, of Israel. Israel, Jacob, was the church in those days. And the family of Jacob, those 12 sons and uh, their families, they were all part of the church. That, that was the church back then. And so when the Bible speaks of Joseph's brethren, it's talking about the church brethren, the brethren who you fellowship with on Sabbath morning in terms of the application. Um, verse 9, it says, He dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made obeisance to me. He must have been pretty proud about his dreams. This is really pretty good, you know. And uh, he told it also to his father, verse 10, and his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now what does envy do to us? What does envy do inside of us, in our hearts? Envy leads us to murder. If we don't actually outright kill someone, we kill them in our hearts because we envy them. Friends, God never promised us equality on this earth. God has promised that he will sustain us and that he will reward us if we are faithful to him. But he's never promised us that we would all be equal. You know, one time my, some of my staff accused me of playing favorites. Because <laughs> I have a, a staff, a group of people down in Australia that is my, my staff. And, and they, they, one, one or two of them accused me of playing favorites. I said, that's right. I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> I play favorites. I play favorites with you because you have certain needs and I try to make sure that your needs are met. I play favorites with you because you have certain needs and I try to make sure your needs are met, but they're different needs. And so I favor one, one then I favor the other. You know, we, we, we have to realize that each of us are different and we can't expect that God will treat us in the same way. Nor has God gifted us with all the same talents. It would be awfully boring if we all had the same talents anyway, wouldn't it? We need each other because we complement each other, and consequently God has to treat us each a little differently because we all have different circumstances and different needs. So this is, but the brethren envied him. Joseph's brethren did not like him. They, they despised him, and eventually this led to them murdering him. So it says here in verse 11, his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. His father sensed that there was something more in this dream, or these dreams that Joseph had had. Verse 12, his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. I want you to think about this for a minute. Joseph's father, uh, or rather Joseph's brothers, could not stand to be with Joseph any longer. They were so upset with him, they could not live in the same house with him. And so they decided to take all of his father's flocks and go north to, Do to Shechem. When they got to Shechem, for whatever reason, well, <laughs> chapter 38 tells us what they did to the people in Shechem. It wasn't very good, it wasn't very nice. And uh, it made their name very odious before the people of Shechem. So they couldn't stay there either. Besides, perhaps they felt they needed to get farther away from their own brother. So they went farther north to Dotham. But they had to get away from Joseph. They couldn't stand to be around him any longer. He was always there telling all about their bad deeds to their father. He was always the, the spiritual, righteous conscience for the family, and that just did not set well with them. So then in verse 13, it tells us that Israel said unto Joseph, 
Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to them, Here am I. Said to him, Here am I. Verse 14, And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. And so he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now these words are very significant. It says here that he sent him out of the vale of Hebron. Now I want you to think about what this really means. Joseph would not come back to Hebron again until after the death of his father many, many, many years later. He would not see his father's tents. He, would, he was being sent out from the comfort and the love and the companionship of his father and his family. He was being sent away never to return. Little did he realize that this was what was going to happen, but that was what was actually going to happen. He would be alienated from his family and his friends and anyone else that he knew and loved. He would be in a strange land with strange ideas and strange lifestyle and strange everything. Now I want you to think about Joseph, before we go any further, as a little boy. Well before he was 17 years of age. Maybe he was five or six or seven years of age. Maybe he was eight or nine years of age. I don't know exactly how old he was, but there's no doubt in my mind that Joseph sat on his father's knee and he listened to the stories of his father and his grandfather. His father, his grandfather Abraham, uh, Isaac, pardon me, and his great grandfather Abraham. In fact, when he was a small child, he may even have sat on his great grandfather's knee um, and listened to the stories of Abraham's walk with God. You know, the stories were very famous, and they were handed down from one generation to the next. Let me just interrupt for a second. Please come, sit down. We have seats right here in the front on this side. Welcome, thank you for coming. We're in Genesis chapter 37. All right. I want you to think about Joseph as a child. He's sitting on his great-grandfather's knee, and he hears the story of how God spoke to Abraham in his tent. When, God, when Abraham was burdened about not having any, any children, and how that God promised Abraham that his children would be as the sand of the sea, and how God called Abraham out of his tent at night, and God said to Abraham, look up at the sky. Abraham looked up at the sky. What do you think he saw in the sky? Stars. Abraham saw the stars in the sky. And God said, count them. And you can imagine Abraham, count. he's telling the story to Joseph, his little boy, his little great-grandson, Joseph. And, and he'd count the stars. One, two, three, four. Oh, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh -oh. wait a minute. I can't count them, God. There's too many, and they're all concentrated together. I can't, I can't seem to count them all. And God says, that is going to be the number of your children, so many that you cannot count them. But I have no child. You leave that to me, God said. So Joseph, uh, J Joseph heard the story of Abraham's experience of faith with God. Abraham had to take God at his word that his children would be as the stars of heaven. That was a promise to Abraham, and Abraham no doubt told his great-grandson Joseph, this is God's promise to you also. You are part of the family that God has promised us. 
And then jo Joseph would sit on his grandfather's knee, Isaac, and on his, great, or his father's knee, Jacob, and he would hear the stories. For instance, the story about Jacob's experience with Christ. Here was Jacob laying on a rock in the middle of the wilderness, running from his brother Esau. And he has a dream. And this is where Joseph began to realize that dreams were a part of God's way of communicating to his church in those days. And um, so Jacob had a dream. And the angels of God were on a ladder coming up and down between heaven and earth. And God promised Jacob that he would be with him wherever he went. And he was not to fear because he had God with him. Are we to fear in our lives, my friends? Fear is not something that is to be part of our experience. Yes, of course there's fear. You, you have a moment of fear if someone comes and, and, and almost drives off the road, you know, and almost has an accident or something. I'm talking about underlying fear of not being able to be saved or the fear of not succeeding in life or the fear of some evil that will come upon you. Friends, we are not to fear. In Christ, there is no fear. Did you hear that? In Christ, there is no fear, brothers and sisters. So Joseph had all of this background of his father's experience and his grandfather's experience and his great-grandfather's experience with God. And as he went to see his brethren, he had no idea that he would never again return to Hebron until after his father had died many years later. He was sent out of the vale of Hebron. God sends you away from your comfort zone. He sends you away from your families. He sends you away from your friends and those who would lead you perhaps even in wrong paths. And he sets you on a course of your own so that you can have your own walk with God. When God sent Joseph out of the vale of Hebron, he was establishing a principle that we also can understand. Because sometimes God sets us out on our own. I've had that experience in my own life. A number of times, in fact, where God has had to take me and break up my fallow ground, as the scripture says, so that I may learn to develop a walk with God. But I could walk with God and learn to depend on God myself. Learn to live in the light of His presence rather than in the sparks of my own kindling. That's God's purpose for us. He wants us to become independent of other human beings and learn to trust in God. And this was what he was doing with Joseph when he sent him out of the vale of Hebron. Verse 15. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan, which is farther north. Joseph went after his brethren and found them at Dothan. He could see them spread out across the fields there in Dothan as he came across above the, the hills, you know, came over the hills. He could see them spread out down there. And um, Verse 18 says that when they saw him, they could see him coming too. How do you think they could see Joseph coming? <coughs> what was he wearing? He was wearing that unmistakable coat of authority. The very last thing they wanted to see. <laughs> oh boy. 
They saw him, and it was unmistakable who it was that was coming to see him, to see them. And it says, when they saw him afar off, verse 18, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. They wanted to kill him. Here he was coming to benefit them, and they wanted to kill him. Now think about this. Who in the history of the world came to benefit the human race, and they killed him? That was Christ. Joseph, you see, is a type of Christ. And I think it's very important for us to understand this, because Joseph, as a type of Christ, is one who has many parallels in his life that relate to the life of Christ. Now let us look at verse 19. By the way, before we leave verse 18, it was the priests who, who um, uh, conspired to slay Christ. It was the priests who did the evil work of trying to oppose Christ and to destroy him. These brethren of Joseph were like the priests in Christ's day. So they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. You can hear the sneer in their voice. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Well, they were going beyond God's purpose, and God was going to prevent that. Notice that they were going to lie to their father that some evil beast had killed him. They were the evil beasts. When you think about it, they were the ones who, who were acting like animals. But Reuben, the eldest, and to whom they had a had a respect and, author and had authority over them, Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand on him. His idea was that he would rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. In other words, Joseph was going to come back later, or rather Reuben was going to come back later and get Joseph out of the pit and send him on his way to his father. But that was not to happen. It was not God's plan for Reuben, Reuben to do this. It was God's plan to use Reuben to prevent his brothers from killing him, but not to deliver him. They all had a part to play, and none of them had it right. <laughs> but that's okay. God still used them anyway. Verse 23. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Now think about what this is saying. Joseph's coat was his, his stature, his authority, his way of relating to his brethren. When Joseph came to his brethren, they were not very pleased with him. And they grabbed him and took his coat. They stripped his coat off from him. Now think about it. What is it saying? These brothers had to remove, symbolically remove the authority, the mantle of authority from Joseph. They had to take him off of his pedestal and bring him down to earth. They had to, as it were, crucify him so that he would no longer have that authority over them. In fact, they had already dethroned Joseph in their hearts. Now they had to dethrone Joseph in his own heart. They had to let Joseph feel that they had 
they had no respect for his authority. After all, he was younger than they were, only older than Benjamin alone. But they had their enmity, their anger was what motivated them to remove his, his authority. So they took him down one step, and then they took him down another step by throwing him into the pit. Look what it says in verse 24. They took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. <clears throat> then they took him down one step farther. They sat down to eat bread and didn't give Joseph any of it. And they lifted up their eyes, the Bible says. So there's three steps. They, they took Joseph down three steps. And then they took him down one more step, as you will see. They sold him into slavery, which is actually worse than death. Slavery is worse than death. And uh, it says in verse 25, they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah had a bright idea. Look what he says. He said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brethren and conceal his blood? We can make some money. We can make some money in this thing. Let's not kill him. He goes on to say, Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. You can hear the false piety in his voice. <laughs> the concealed venom of piety, false piety. And his brethren were content. You know, we can sometimes treat our brothers in the church that way and our sisters in the church that way. We can piously um, stab them in the back, you know, uh, in very pious-sounding ways. We have to be careful, my friends, how we treat our brothers and sisters. And that's the great lesson of the story of Joseph. Then it says in verse 28, then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the who? Who did they sell him to? The Ishmaelites. So the Midianites came and the Ishmaelites, they sold to the Ishmaelites. These are the same people. The Midianites and the Ishmaelites. Wait a minute. The, the Ishmaelites were from whom? Ishmael. And who was their mother? Who was the mother of the Ishmaelites? Hagar. She was, well, was Ishmael the son of promise? No. Who was Midian? He was also a son of Abraham. And who was his mother? That's the one most people don't know. Anyone know? Keturah, that's right, thank you. Keturah was the mother of Midian. Keturah was the wife of Abraham after Sarah died. So he was younger. Um, Midian is actually younger than, than Jacob. Or sorry, than, than um, Isaac. So now we have two of the sons of Abraham... Neither of them are the sons of promise. And so God gave them the ministry of trade and commerce. And they became very wealthy. In fact, they became so wealthy that some of them um, are described in Isaiah chapter 60 as bringing wealth to God's people during the latter rain, in the time when the latter rain is poured out at the end of time, in our time, in our day. But that's another story for another time. Um, this story tells us that the Midianites and the Ishmaelites were now united together through business and trade and also through intermarriage and other ways. They had united together and now 
they were the same people, the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. And Joseph was taken out of the pit, and sold, they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And these Midianite Ishmaelites brought Joseph down to Egypt. Now the brethren were rid of this nuisance known as Joseph. Now they would not have to listen to his, his righteous harping on their, on their lives. They would not have to have him standing over them as a conscience and a barrier to their evil deeds. And in verse 29 it says, Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes, and he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? What, what's wrong with you? Verse 31. Now I want you to think about Reuben for a minute. Reuben had good intentions toward Joseph but he had also been involved with his brother's sins and crimes. And he was more loyal to his brethren than to Joseph. But yet he did not want to, he had a sense of responsibility. He did not want to see Joseph injured or hurt in any way. He was intending to send Joseph back to his father, which was a good thing, but it was not God's plan. You know, many times good things are not God's plan. We have to remember that. But Reuben was now distressed. And because of his compromise with his brethren, he was now drawn into their lies and into their, into their deception with their father. You know, if you don't take a stand, my friends, and Reuben took something of a stand by saying, don't kill him, but Reuben should have right then sent him back home to his father. Right in front of his brethren. He didn't do that. He was intending to quietly remove Joseph from the pit and send him home quietly when his brothers were busy with other things. What do you think would have happened if Joseph would have been delivered by Reuben and sent back home to his father? Joseph would have certainly told his father what happened to him. And this would have created problems for the family, big problems, because they intended to kill Joseph. You can imagine how Jacob would have felt if he had learned of Joseph's, uh, from Joseph what his brothers had tried to do. Now Reuben could no longer stand independent of his brothers. He was drawn into their deception. And it says, They took Joseph's coat, verse 31, and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and they said, This we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Jacob was devastated. Absolutely devastated. He didn't realize, he wasn't thinking. His brothers had actually separated themselves from Joseph. They were distancing themselves from responsibility as well as from their brother when they said, it's thy son, it is not our brother. Thy son. Is this not thy son's coat? They didn't say this is not our brother's coat. Is this not his? So they were, they were in a way, they were putting a knife into Jacob. Maybe even without realizing it. And the Bible says in verse 33, he knew it and said, It is my son's coat, an evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt rent in pieces. 
Okay, so now his brethren had lied to their father, and the fact is they would have to maintain that lie for over 20 years. They would have to watch their father grieve for over 20 years. And they would have to keep their mouth shut for 20 years as they maintained this facade of a deception. Verse 34, Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him. Just think about this. His sons and daughters rose up to comfort him in his distress. Was this sincere comfort? <laughs> Not at all. This is fake comfort. In fact, they brought him fake news. <laughs> so we can be sure that in the last days there will be fake news about God's people. There will be those who will misrepresent God's people, just like they misrepresented Christ. There were false witnesses that came against Christ. And there will be false witnesses that come against God's people. Fake news, we say. And his sons and daughters rose up in their hypocrisy to try and comfort Jacob. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now I want you to think for a minute. At the time of the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross, all heaven was in stunned silence with what happened at the hand of his brethren to Jesus Christ. And as they mourned, as heaven mourned for Christ, the earth was dark, and the thunder roared, and the lightning struck. But then, over the Sabbath, the Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead, and all heaven was rejoicing once again. You know, Jacob's anguish and sorrow over his son's death is like the anguish and sorrow of God over the loss of Christ or over the crucifixion of Christ. Now, let us think about Joseph's journey to Egypt for a few minutes. You can imagine Joseph traveling down to Egypt with these Ishmaelites. He would have to sleep on the earth, the, 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 the ground. You know, for us children today, that's fun, that's camping. <laughs> but not Joseph. Here he was chained to other slaves, perhaps, and other uh, camels and merchandise and whatever, and, and uh, he'd have to sleep on the ground. And no doubt, as he got closer to Hebron, as they went farther south, his mind began to wonder if maybe someone would come from his father's house and rescue him. Think about that. What, a, what about a rescue? Do you think, you think there could be a rescue? Maybe so. If somebody would rescue Joseph, would that have been good? Would there have been rejoicing in Hebron if Joseph would have been rescued from the Ishmaelites? Sure. Everyone would have been happy. But would it have fulfilled God's plan? No. It would not have fulfilled God's purpose not only for Joseph, but for his family and all of Egypt and all the other countries around. You see, God knew that he needed Joseph in a certain way in Egypt. He didn't just want him as a slave. He wanted him for something far better than that. But it had to start out with a slave. You see, Joseph's brothers crucified him, so to speak. They cut him down. And whenever God cuts you down, my friends, he has a plan. Don't just get discouraged and despondent and say that there's nothing in this. But God has a plan for those who he cuts down or who he allows to be cut down. And if you've never been cut down in your life, 
if you've never been stabbed in the back, if you've never been mistreated by anyone, if you've never had a bad experience like that, you just haven't lived long enough. You just haven't lived long enough. <laughs> so, Joseph lay at night on the ground, weeping silently, perhaps to himself, grieving over the, the separation from his family. And as Hebron went farther and farther in the distance, finally it fell on his mind that there was no rescue attempt that was going to come before him, or come for him. And when he finally realized that no one was going to rescue him, that he was going to be alone in Egypt, Think about that. How would you have felt if you were Joseph? You know, sometimes God separates us from our friends and our families, and he puts us alone so that we can learn to trust him. And while Joseph was going down to Egypt, sleeping on the ground each night, no doubt when he realized that Hebron was not going to come to his rescue, as he wept, his eyes were full of tears. No doubt he looked up at the sky, and what do you think he saw? The stars. And he remembered the story that his great-grandfather Abraham had told him about how that God had promised him that he would make of him a great nation, and that even that as Abraham told Joseph that he was part of that great promise, now that promise came, became Joseph's own promise. Joseph possessed Abraham's promise and the promises that God made to Isaac and the promises that God made to um, Jacob, his father. You see, my friends, those promises are also for us. God has not only promised us eternal life, but he's promised us a great nation, meaning that if you are faithful to Christ and the Holy Spirit is in your heart and in your life and you are winning souls to Christ, you will have many who will be in the kingdom of heaven as it were your spiritual children. Perhaps you won't even be able to count them. Those promises were for Joseph too. And when Joseph finally grasped that God had something special for him to do in Egypt. He did not know what. He took on this promise for himself. He possessed the promise for himself. And by the time he got to Egypt, he could now stand erect. He could now stand firm and confident in his God, who was now his God. It wasn't just his father's God. It wasn't just his grandfather's God. It wasn't just his great-grandfather's God. It was his God. If there's anything that God wants us to understand in this life, is to understand God for ourselves. Not through somebody else. Not through our parents. Not through our friends. Not through the pastor but for ourselves. And the only way we can really understand God for ourselves is if we study the Bible. And we must understand the Bible for ourselves. Joseph's trip to Egypt was the turning point in Joseph's life. There at the point of alienation, Joseph now had an opportunity to stand on his own two feet after 17 years of life, lived in a, in a very warm and friendly, nurturing environment, coddled by his father, hated by his brothers, protected by his father. Now he was on his own. How would he do? Would he be faithful to God? Or would he compromise himself with the Egyptians? 
Well, that's all we have time for at this moment, so we'll take a break at that point. We'll come back to the story at our next hour, at the Divine Hour, and we'll study the life of Joseph in Egypt. Let us pray. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for what we've learned about Joseph so far. Joseph's troublesome coat. It has gotten him in great difficulty. He is now a slave in Egypt, or to be a slave in Egypt. Lord, we pray that we may learn the lessons of the life of Joseph as they apply not only to the life of Christ, but to our own lives in these last days. And we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.